The second aspect of right effort is the effort to abandon the arisen unwholesome states, that is, to eliminate the defilements that have arisen. When we see in our mind that one of these unwholesome states is present, we have to apply our energy to eliminate it. This can be done by a variety of methods. In one sutta, the Buddha gives five different methods for training the mind to overcome unwholesome states. One method is to replace the unwholesome thought formation by its opposite, by the wholesome thought exactly opposed to it. For example, if strong attachment arises in the mind to, say, wealth or possessions, then we can reflect on the impermanence of those possessions. And when we do that, the attachment fades away. If strong sensual desire arises in the mind, especially for a monk or a nun or a meditating yogi, then if he reflects on the impure nature of the body, how the body is just a heap of skin, bones, organs, and blood, then the sense desire fades away. When anger and ill will towards a person arise in the mind, then by reflecting or meditating on loving kindness, the feeling of loving kindness will dispel the anger. Or if a state of depression, or dejection arises in the mind, then reflecting on the noble qualities of the Buddha gives a kind of joy and encouragement which inspires us to make further effort. So in that way, we use one thought, a wholesome thought, to knock out the unwholesome thought. In the same way that, for example, a carpenter might use a clean new peg to knock out an old rotten peg from a board of wood. A second method to use is to develop a keen sense of the danger in the unwholesome thought to recognize how they keep us entangled in suffering and prevent us from accomplishing the real good for ourselves and for others. Still, another method is to turn the mind away from the objects that are stimulating the unwholesome thoughts, to divert the mind to some other object of concentration. For example, perhaps just to the breathing or to some mov the movement of some part of the body. A fourth method is simply to observe the thoughts themselves, to turn the attention upon the thoughts, to see how they arise, then gradually to still them, to make them quiet down. This can be done also by tracing the causes of the thoughts in sequence, seeing that thought arises from this cause, that cause from this cause, and so on, back in sequence. This makes the disturbing thoughts quiet down. Then, when all of these other techniques fail, and only then, the last measure which can be used is to meet the unwholesome thought in face-to-face -face combat, to struggle with it, and to expel it from the mind. But this should be used only as the last measure. Okay, now we come to the other side, the third and fourth aspects of right effort. On the other side of the mind, we find that there are many pure, wholesome, virtuous states of mind. And for these two, there are two tasks to be performed. First, we have to make the effort to develop the undeveloped wholesome states. We have many beautiful potentials stored up in the mind, we have to bring these up to the surface of the mind, to develop them, strengthen them, to make them shine forth. Then, when we've cultivated them, then we come to the fourth aspect of right effort. We have to avoid falling into complacency, but we have to make further sustained effort to maintain the wholesome states that have been developed. We have to stabilize them, then bring them to full growth and completion. Thus the two aspects of right effort on the wholesome side are first to develop the undeveloped wholesome states and then second to maintain, increase and complete the wholesome states that have been developed. 
By applying these four aspects of right effort step by step, we can cleanse the mind of its defilements until it becomes bright and pure and radiant. Now, it might seem that right intentions and right effort are very similar. And though they are very similar in some respects, they're not exactly the same. Right intentions, the second factor of the path, means the basic purpose or direction of the mind. And right effort, the sixth factor, is the actual application of energy to eliminate the unwholesome states and to develop and perfect the wholesome states. In the actual practice of the path, these factors are so closely intertwined that we can't draw a sharp dividing line between them. They actually function together. But what we can do is to distinguish their distinct functions. Right intention is the factor which directs the mind. Right effort is the energy or mental power which energizes the mind. We might compare the two to the steering wheel and the carburetor of the car. The steering wheel determines the direction of movement. The carburetor burns the fuel to supply the energy. And both contribute to the actual movement of the car. And when the car is moving, we can't precisely distinguish these two functions since they both cooperate with each other. Now, a further word of caution has to be added about right effort. When we say that right effort has to be made, this doesn't mean that we should just strive blindly. The mind is a very delicate instrument, and the development of the mind requires a very precise balancing of the different mental faculties. We need an alert, clear, keen degree of mindfulness to recognize what kind of mental state we're in. We also need a certain degree of wisdom to know how to keep the mind in balance, how to prevent it from veering towards extremes. This is an aspect of the middle way. It means striking the right balance in practice, knowing how to harmonize the different faculties to gain the maximum contribution from each without doing any harm to the mind without exhausting the mind on the one hand, without letting it go into stagnation on the other. Especially in developing energy, we have to develop the energy in a middle way, in a balanced way. And to illustrate this point, there's a certain story that's come down in the text. The Buddha had a disciple whose name was Sona. Before he became a monk, Sona had previously been a musician. He had played the veena, the Indian lute. After he took ordination as a monk, he was very eager to reach enlightenment. And so he went off into solitude and he began to practice with great enthusiasm, with very strong burst of energy. He applied himself day and night practicing meditation constantly until after some time his mind just became restless and tense and all of his vigor was exhausted. Then he became discouraged. He thought, no matter how hard I try, I can't get any place. Therefore, I better leave the Sangha and return to the worldly life. So he went to the Buddha. He told the Buddha that he'd done his best. He'd made a wholehearted effort to reach enlightenment but he couldn't gain even the basic stages of mental concentration. Therefore, he said, now I'm going to leave the Sangha and return home. The Buddha approached this case very skillfully. The Buddha didn't just begin discussing his problem directly. Instead, the Buddha asked him, he said, what did you do before you became a monk? Soma said, before I became a monk, I used to be a musician. I played the lute. Then the Buddha said, Tell me, when you were tuning up your lute, if you tuned the strings very tightly, what would happen? Could you play well? No, then I couldn't play the lute very well. The pitch would be too high, and sometimes the strings would break. Then the Buddha asks, 
when you left the strings very loose, then could you play the lute? Sona said, no. When the strings were left loose, when the strings were left loose, then I would just get a dull droning sound. And I couldn't get very good music coming from my instrument. Well then, the Buddha asked, how could you get good music from the lute? Sona answered, well, to get good music, I would tune the strings that they weren't too tight and weren't too loose. Then I could get perfect music out of the lute. The Buddha said, that's just the key to practicing the path, to be in balance, not too tight and not too loose. You shouldn't be too exertive, since that just exhausts your energies. It makes your mind tense and restless, and it leads to discouragement. On the other hand, you shouldn't be slack and negligent. If you become negligent, then you can't make any progress at all. The way to practice is according to the middle way. Balance energy with calm, then you can make progress. Sona went back to his meditation cell. He practiced the way the Buddha taught him, and in time he reached his goal and became one of the foremost outstanding disciples of the Buddha. To develop the mind further, to make it capable of gaining concentration and insight, we have to enter the practice of the next factor of the path, right mindfulness, samasati. Now what is meant by right mindfulness? Right mindfulness is the clear awareness of what is happening in us and around us at the successive moments of experience. Mindfulness is a form of attention. To practice mindfulness involves attending to our experience. But mindfulness differs somewhat from ordinary attention. Ordinarily, attention, the faculty of attention, is used as an instrument for serving our purposes, our biological and psychological needs. Attention serves as an instrument of the rest of the mind, so that we notice what the mind demands and desires. We notice the things that serve the mind's desires. We neglect the other things. We don't attend to them. But mindfulness is a kind of attention which operates independently of all ulterior aims and purposes. Mindfulness is an attention which observes our experience carefully and precisely, always attending to what is occurring in the present without limiting the obser field of observation without making any discriminations, without s subordinating the acts of attention to, to external purposes. Mindfulness is attention concerned only with attending, with observing what is happening in the present simply for the sake of knowing and understanding what's happening, not for the sake of serving some utilitarian end. Mindfulness is attention that functions in an atmosphere of, a, of detachment. It's attention that aspires towards a pure objectivity, an awareness which reflects the nature of objects exactly as they are, without adding to them, without elaborating upon them, without interpreting them through the screens of subjective evaluation and commentary. The Buddha divides the practice of mindfulness according to its objects into four groups called the four foundations of mindfulness. These are the mindful contemplation of the body, the mindful contemplation of feelings, the mindful contemplation of states of mind, and the mindful contemplation of mind objects. The practice of right mindfulness consists in the mindful contemplation of these four objects. In mindful contemplation of the body, 
the practitioner has to develop a continuous awareness of the bodily process. Begin with the grossest object, the physical body. The mindfulness of the body includes a number of exercises. The most basic of these is the mindfulness of breathing, anapanasati. Sitting in a comfortable cross-legged posture, the meditator, when breathing in, becomes aware of breathing in. When breathing out, he becomes aware simply of breathing out. When taking a long breath, he's aware of the long breath. When taking a short breath, he becomes aware of a short breath. Thus the mindfulness just follows the in and out movement of the breath exactly as it occurs. This mindfulness can then become extended from the breathing to all the different aspects of bodily experience. The whole body itself becomes the object of mindfulness attended to with mindfulness. The body becomes analyzed into its component parts its organs, its tissues, and so on. So the body becomes laid out, as it were, on a slide, a mental slide, available to our contemplation. Mindfulness of the body can further be applied to action, to the different postures of the body, walking, sitting, standing, and lying, to the different activities, eating, moving about, going to the bathroom, lying down, speaking. Every aspect of physical experience of the body eventually comes into the range of mindful contemplation. The second foundation of mindfulness is mindfulness of feeling. This involves attending to the feelings that arise on the different moments of experience. The pleasant feelings, the painful feelings, the neutral feelings. Whatever feeling arises, is attended to with bare mindfulness, without liking and disliking. We simply become aware of whatever feeling has arisen. In this way, we prevent the mind from getting sucked into the feelings, from grasping after pleasure, from running away after pain. The mind becomes able to look at all the states of experience with calm equanimity and self-possession. The third foundation of mindfulness is the mind itself, that is, the general state of consciousness. To practice the contemplation of the mind, we have to see into the actual present state of mind clearly and precisely. We have to understand what kind of mental state is occurring. We have to clearly reflect the state without judging, without reproaching ourselves for the unwholesome states, without congratulating ourselves for the wholesome states. We just see the nature of the state of mind with detached observation. Then we have to determine the nature of that state, whether it's a wholesome state or an unwholesome one. Then we have to see into the kind of wholesome or unwholesome state of mind, whether it's a state that has attachment, aversion, or delusion, whether a state free from attachment, aversion, and delusion and so on. Whatever state of a mind arises is noted just as it is, then allowed to go its own way without clinging to it. The third foundation of mindfulness is called Dhammanupasana, the contemplation of Dhammas. The Dhammas spoken of here are the factors and objects of the mind. At this level of mindfulness, we tune in on the specific contents of the mind rather than the general state of mind as we did in the previous exercise. Here the mind is dissected into its components to see what factors are at work within it, whether the defilements are present or the wholesome factors. Then if the defilements are present, we have to note their presence, then investigate them to see how they arise, how they can be eliminated, how they can be prevented from occurring in the future. Then when the beneficial factors, states leading to liberation arise, we become aware that they are present. Then we investigate how they arise and how they can be developed, how they can be perfected. Mindfulness of dhammas also has another aspect, that is the contemplation of the basic factors of experience. 
not from the standpoint of ethical evaluation, but as a pure contemplative exercise aimed at insight, as seeing into the true characteristics of the body-mind process. But this we will deal with at greater length in the, in the following talk. Now, right effort and right mindfulness work together in close cooperation. Right mindfulness makes us aware what kind of state has arisen, whether a wholesome state or an unwholesome one. Then, through right effort, we apply our energy to eliminate the unwholesome states, the states that lead us into greater destruction and entanglement. And again, through right effort, we strive to arouse and strengthen the wholesome states that lead to calm and to clarity. Right effort and right mindfulness are both directed to the eighth factor of the path, right concentration, sama samadhi. Right concentration is defined as wholesome one-pointedness of mind. It is the wholesome unification of the mind, the mind collected and focused upon its object without disturbance or wavering. To develop right concentration, we generally begin with a single object, a very simple object, an attempt to fix the mind on that object so it remains there without wavering. We use right effort to keep the mind focused on the object and right mindfulness to be aware of the hindrances to concentration and the aids to concentration. Then we use our effort to eliminate the hindrances and to strengthen the aids, the beneficial factors. With repeated practice, the mind becomes gradually still unified and concentrated, brought to a single point. And when the mind gets concentrated, the hindrances are suppressed, and the mind becomes very tranquil. With further practice, we can develop certain deep states of absorption called the jhanas. These are four in number, ranked according to descending levels of calm and concentration. We'll deal with these in greater detail in the next talk. But this kind of concentration that's developed through this one-pointed practice, this is not yet the end of the practice of the path. When right concentration is made the eighth factor, this can lead to the misunderstanding that concentration is the final step of the path, the goal in the rest of the path. But that is a mistake. Rather, the state of concentration which is reached, where the mind is stilled and collected, serves as the means for developing insight. With the calm, collected mind, we have to go back to reach the first factor of the path, to reach right view. We set out to develop right view again. But this time we're not concerned with right view as a conceptual understanding of the Dharma. Now we're working to get a right vision of the Dharma, to get a vision of the truth. We set out to transform right view from idea into perception, into the direct seeing of the truth. And the way to go about this is as follows. Having gained a measure of concentration, we take the concentrated mind and apply it again to the practice of right mindfulness, the seventh factor. As a result of having developed concentration, the mind has become a powerful tool, a real strong instrument of awareness, very clear and calm. So we apply this clear, calm, collected mind to the four foundations of mindfulness, contemplating the body, the feelings, the states of mind, and the mind objects. Then as the mind examines the flow of events in the body-mind process, as it tunes in on the flow from moment to moment, gradually there occurs step by step the arising of insight, which penetrates into the real mark of things. And as insight builds up, as it matures and deepens, 
it turns into panya, wisdom, the liberating wisdom which sees into the Four Noble Truths. At this peak of development, the seeing of the Four Noble Truths becomes direct and immediate, and it brings the destruction of the defilements, the purification of the mind, and the liberation of the mind from the fetters. But these higher aspects of concentration and insight, as I said, we will deal with in greater detail in the next talk. So we leave off here. Now, having explained the eight factors of the path, we should understand that these eight factors can be distributed into three basic groups. These three groups are moral discipline, concentration, and wisdom. In Pali, Sila, Samadhi and Panya. The group of moral discipline includes right speech, right action, and right livelihood. All of these commonly share in the nature of being parts of moral discipline. The group of concentration, the Samadhi Kanda, includes three factors, right effort, right mindfulness, and right concentration. The last of these, right concentration, is the primar primary member of the group. The other two work together to bring about the state of deep concentration. Therefore, this last factor gives its name to the entire set. Then the last training group is wisdom, the Panya Kanda. This includes the two factors, right view and right intentions. Right view represents the direct experiential aspect of wisdom. The inclusion of right intention shows another side to wisdom. It shows the purposive side of wisdom, that wisdom is not merely a matter of passive understanding, but an understanding that has the effect of altering our attitudes and goals that shows up in our purposes, intentions, and motivations. The three aspects of the path are to be developed with one stage acting as the base for the other. We begin with a kind of preliminary right view and right intentions. These come at the very outset. They're really the forerunners of the threefold training rather than a part of it. To embark on the threefold way, we need a certain right understanding of the nature of existence and the right motivations, the right intentions for taking up the practice. Then we enter the actual training with the factors of moral discipline. We strive to purify our discipline through right speech, right action, and right livelihood. Moral discipline acts as the basis for developing concentration. Then when the mind is calm and concentrated, that acts as the basis for developing wisdom. When wisdom is fully developed, it results in liberation, the release of the mind from all defilements. Now, there are two kinds of Noble Eightfold Path. This is an important distinction which has to be remembered. First, there is the mundane path, the Lokya Magga. This is the path that's developed on occasions when we make a deliberate effort to practice the eight path factors. When we try to purify our discipline, to develop concentration, and to arouse insight, either in limited day-to-day -day practice or else in intensive periods of practice as on retreats, we make an all-out effort to develop mindfulness, concentration, and insight. And this is called the mundane path, Lokya Mugga. But the name has to be understood correctly. This mundane path is not a worldly path in the ordinary sense, a path leading to wealth, fame, or to worldly success. The mundane path leads to enlightenment. And in fact, we have to practice the mundane path in order to reach the supramundane path. Without practicing the mundane Eightfold Noble Path, 
we cannot reach the super mundane path. The mundane path is called mundane because even at its highest level in inside contemplation, it still involves the contemplation of conditioned objects, things included in the five aggregates. In this respect, it differs from the super mundane path, which is the direct seeing of Nibbana, the unconditioned element. And also, it should not be understood that one is practicing the Noble Eightfold Path simply when one is trying to live by moral principles. People too often think that the Noble Eightfold Path is simply a path of ethical conduct and that as long as they're living within the basic framework of morality, that then they're practicing or living in accordance with the Noble Eightfold Path. That is not the case. The Noble Eightfold Path is the way leading to the cessation of dukkha. It's a path that includes eight factors and it's really directly being developed and practiced only when all eight factors are working in cooperation to steer us towards the cessation of dukkha, towards the attainment of nibbana. The occasions when we're really practicing and developing the Noble Eightfold Path will be times when our mental vision, our God, our outlook and understanding are guided by right views, by an understanding of the basic unsatisfactoriness of our existence, and the understanding that the real liberation is the attainment of nirvana. There will be occasions when our motivation is correct, when we're moved to reach deliverance from dukkha, to renounce the attachments to all the different conditioned things of the world. There will be times when our conduct is grounded upon moral discipline, upon the three training factors of moral discipline, and when we're making a right effort to purify the mind by cultivating the four foundations of mindfulness with a deeply concentrated mind. On those occasions, we can say that we're developing the mundane Noble Eightfold Path. But the Noble Eightfold Path is something much deeper, much more powerful than, simple, than a simple ethical way of life. Now when we practice the mundane path, as we reach the higher levels and enter the stage of mature insight, our understanding gets deeper and deeper, sharper and sharper. And when insight reaches its climax, when it reaches the highest peak, then at some unexpected moment, a sudden and radical change can take place. When wisdom stands at its highest point, if all the faculties of the mind are fully mature and the wish for enlightenment is strong and steady, then the mind turns away from all conditioned phenomena. At the same time that it turns away from all conditioned phenomena, the mind becomes focused on the unconditioned element. That is, the mind breaks through to the perception of Nibbana, the realization of Nibbana. It sees directly into the truth of the deathless element, the unconditioned. And when this happens, then all the eight factors of the path rise up simultaneously with great power of penetration, focusing upon Nibbana. Therefore, at this time, the eight factors constitute the super-mundane Noble Eightfold Path, or the transcendental path. At this time, right view arises, not as right understanding, right conceptual understanding, not even as the right view of insight, but as the actual seeing of the unconditioned. Right intentions arise as the full renunciation of craving, as the cutting off of the dispositions to sense desire, to ill will, and to harmfulness. Right speech, right action, right livelihood arise 
as mental factors cutting off the dispositions to wrong speech, right, wrong action, and wrong livelihood. Right effort arises as mental energy, which is empowering this very powerful state of consciousness that's focused on Nibbana. Right mindfulness arises as the faculty of attention or awareness fixed upon Nibbana as its object. And right concentration is the unification of mind, the mind focused upon Nibbana. So these eight factors have all arisen simultaneously, all performing their function, their functions. And the mind equipped with these eight factors, this is the super mundane consciousness, the mind which has risen up out of the world and now knows the unconditioned reality transcendent to the world. And these supramundane states of the path, these come in four stages. There are four levels to the supramundane path. The first is called the path of stream entry, the second the path of the once returner, the third the path of the non returner and the fourth, the path of arhatship. We will deal with them in greater length next time. Now the path experience lasts only for a moment, but when it occurs, that moment of consciousness cuts off and eradicates a certain set of defilements. It cuts them off right at the roots so that they can never arise again. And the first time that the path arises, the path of stream entry, the yogi enters irreversibly upon the way to liberation. From the point he reaches stream entry on, he can never fall away. Up to this point, he could still fall back, he could still be swept back into the current of the world. He has no absolute assurance of winning the goal. But when he reaches the super mundane path of stream entry, in this one moment of realization, a complete change takes place in the very bottom of his consciousness. In this moment, he becomes a stream enterer, one who has fallen into the stream to liberation and can never return back again into the way of the world. Following the peak experience of stream entry, the yogi might still have more work to do. He still has three more attainments of the super mundane path lying ahead. Each of these other path moments will again eradicate certain sets of defilements and liberate the yogi from a corresponding degree of bondage to samsara. When the pa fourth path is attained and finished, then he becomes an arhant, one who has cut off all defilements and reached full liberation. Now, the yogi who has become a stream enterer, he might have as many as seven more lifetimes in which to move in samsara before he reaches arhatship. But he can never fall away. He can never be reborn in any of the lower worlds. And he is certain that he will reach liberation in no more than seven lifetimes.